Italy, one of the greatest countries on earth. It's achingly, achingly beautiful. It's like a mirage. I'm Alex Polizzi, and my Italian heritage is intrinsic to who I am. Buongiorno. I've got a treasure trove of childhood memories that were made here. Now I'm returning on a voyage of discovery that will take me from top to toe. It gives me shivers to be back. Immersing myself in the culture of its vast regions. <laughs> Reconnecting with my roots. Hi, darling. And uncovering some of this magnificent country's secrets. This has completely blown me away. Wow. Wow. This is one of the glories of Italy, and if you haven't seen it, you really should come. My grand tour starts in the north, on a trip that will take me from the completely historic to the unmistakably modern. From the exquisite beauty of Venice to the bustle of chic Milan. Venice, in my eyes, one of the wonders of the world. It's the perfect place to start my Italian odyssey. Whenever I come here, I always think it's such a miracle that Venice is still inhabited. It's achingly, achingly beautiful. And it's like a mirage. It doesn't seem real. It's a city I know well. My grandmother, who I called Nonna, was Venetian. I must have been here at least 40 times in my life. And it can be smelly, and it can be busy, and my goodness, it's expensive, but none of that matters. You just feel like you're treading in the steps of some of the great painters and architects and great thinkers who've ever walked this earth. It's no secret Venice is a popular destination. An estimated 20 million people visit each year. But there is one way you can have this city almost to yourself. If you can drag yourself out of bed, you'll be rewarded. Piazza San Marco, the very heart of Venice. Almost impossible to visit these days because of the crowds. The only way to do it is very early in the morning or very late at night. Grazie. Buona giornata. This is early morning. There's very few people around except your average Venetian taking his daily run, the street sweepers, the cafes for the workmen, and me finally being able to get up close and personal with some of the beauties that you come to Venice to see. I think it is very easy at this time of day to feel as if it's all a stage set. It is so beautiful. In five hours' time, this whole street will be a river of humanity. Very unpleasant. <laughs> There's a crude ship that's about to disgorge 5,000 people into the streets of Venice, all with a packed lunch and a bottle of water. It looks completely wrong. I mean, look, it's as tall as the Campanile. It's just ridiculous. We're right opposite the Bridge of Sighs. I think this is the first time in years that I haven't had to fight my way through six layers of tourists with cameras. People come here with a list of things to see and tick them off and rush off and never, ever get a chance to soak in the true beauty. St. Mark's Square is one of the most iconic sites in Venice and one of the priciest, too. You can get the most expensive coffee in the world here. We had two orange juices, a bottle of water, four coffees and two cappuccinos. And I think the whole lot came to 200 euros. 
In the old days, there was a little old lady here who used to sell birdseed, and you'd have all these pigeons on you. I've got so many photos like that at home of us younger covered in these flying mats. Nowadays, feeding the pigeons is enormously discouraged because they've worked out how bad they are. It's amazing to think that under this very solid seeming square lies fathoms and fathoms of water. It's quite easy to completely forget that this is a city in the middle of the sea. It's places like Venice that marks us out as a civilised world. And it makes me sad because I don't think that we're creating anything these days that is as impressive. And this is miraculous on so many levels. It's the triumph of faith and hope, determination and tenacity. Feast your eyes on this square as empty as it is, because this is the last time today it's going to look like this. Venice is romantic and magical on any budget. But it can be dazzling if you have money to burn. Open your wallet wide and you can find suites fit for Hollywood film stars. This is the playground of the rich and famous. There are 12 five-star hotels in the city. I think one of the finest is the Hotel Bauer owned by Francesca Bortolotto, a Venetian through and through. So, Francesca, I feel like I have a connection with Venice because of my nonna, and every time I arrive, I feel tearful at the beauty of it. I mean, it takes my breath away still now, and I've come at least once a year, every year of my life. For me, it has the same effect, and the whole world comes to Venice, yep. so, you know, every day you you wake up and you look at this and uh, you know why you're so privileged. Francesca has agreed to give me an exclusive glimpse of their most exclusive suite. Here we go, darling. Wow. That's wow. what you wanted to see. Uh, this yeah. is amazing. I don't know what to look at first. I think it's one of the most dramatic uh, rooms of Venice. And Charles and Camilla, they were here, by the way, and they love this room. But they consider this very close to home. This room is aptly called the Royal Suite, and it comes at a royal price, 15,000 euros a night. It's the most stunning, stunning room. The Church of La Salute is what I consider maybe the most iconic view of Venice. The opulent suite is decorated in traditional Venetian style, with silk fabrics, period furnishings, and original Murano glass chandeliers. Every touch of luxury is obsessed about, even down to the handmade bathroom products. Like a lot in the royal suite, it's locally sourced, made in a small but high-tech cosmetics lab in the city. The lab produces soaps and lotions for the city's best hotels, using fragrances grown in its own garden. What's surprising is that this garden is in a female penitentiary. And the people making the soaps are inmates. And uh, here it is. Uh... This is the first time I've ever set foot in a prison. Francesca is one of the founders of the project. Mm, very it's delicate. Quite, it's very delicate, and uh, of course they are more expensive than average uh, amenities in the hotel. So it's all natural? All natural, yeah. Oh, this is very good, I love this. Mm. Currently, there are three inmates working in the cosmetics lab. A con artist, a Romanian caught up in drug trafficking, and a young North African girl involved in a theft. Another five inmates tend the garden, where they also grow fruit and veg to sell to local people. Queue outside the prison on a Wednesday morning, and you can buy some of the freshest fruit and vegetables in the city. People who work in the laboratory get paid, don't they? Of course. Then not only they get paid, 
but then they get a certificate when they leave the jail that they have been working, and so when they get out, they can be more suitable to find another job. Once you have a difficulty in your life, and for good or bad, I'm not criticizing, but then you do, you're doing something beautiful. It makes you feel better, you know. And if you've done something not so beautiful, this is a way to straighten up in some way what your past has been. Venice is certainly a city of surprises, and there are more to come. Many centuries ago, the Republic of Venice was known as La Serenissima, which translates as the most serene. But you wouldn't think it when you see its crowded canals today. Venice is a city literally built on water. Everything you have to do in an ordinary city, you have to do here on a boat. My grandmother, who only died five years ago, who was Venetian, said to me that the Rialto used to be a hive of industry. Venice has been a city of merchants, that's why it exists. It was a staging post between the east and the west. It brought all the spices that were so in demand. The modern merchants of Venice fight through the waterways and canals with the city's gondoliers. For centuries, the iconic gondolas were the chief means of transportation in the city. These days, they are mainly very expensive water taxis, costing 80 euros for a 40-minute ride. It is estimated that there were 8 to 10,000 gondolas during the 17th and 18th century. Now, only 425 remain. A gondola is made up of eight different kinds of wood. For a gondolier, the most vital part is the forcola, the lock the oar is held in. It enables the gondolier to change the speed and the direction of his boat. Every forcola is a unique piece, bespoke and handcrafted to the needs of each individual gondolier. It's a dying art. Only four Orlock producers remain in the whole of Venice. At 30 years of age, Pierre Audry is the youngest. How long have you been doing this? It's about uh, eight years. What did you do before? <laughs> before I studied astronomy. How many hours does it take you to make an orlock? 30, 35. When you start from the piece of tree, I look at it and I say, oh no, <laughs> it's very difficult. <laughs> Piero has offered to let me in on a local secret. Venice lies on an archipelago made up of 118 islands. It's separated by 177 canals and linked by 409 bridges. And it's clearly best seen from the water. As a Venetian born and bred, Piero has offered to take me off the beaten track and give me a local's guide to some of its most beautiful canals. This is amazing because your workshop is about 100 metres away from the Rialto Bridge, but it's a world away. It feels like a different city. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Venice is divided in six uh, big uh, areas, no? We are drifting through the Canareggio, the northernmost of the six historic districts. Here, you can almost forget the hustle and bustle of the tourists and really admire this beautiful place. So there's some areas where the gondoliers tend to congregate. Yeah. And then other waterways, come questa, that you never see it, you don't see anybody. Si, si, è vero. In the in the most part of Venice, we live only with tourism. You can find the real uh, shops uh, that uh, a human <laughs> uh, need in a, in a city for for his life, no? The Iron Monger, and... the supermarket. Si, 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 si. School pickup time. Yeah. If there's only forty-eight thousand people who live here. What, who lives in the other apartments? I mean, is there a lot of empty uh, houses? Yeah, yeah. Many are empty because our second, second properties or American people or whatever. 
And uh, the problem is that they come here one, one time every year. Or... Yeah. You know, Venice will only continue to exist if real people live here. The problem is, rather like London, that Venetians are priced out of the city. And so there's less and less vita del popolo, everyday life here. It's become almost like a Disneyland. Sorry? È diventato quasi come un Disneyland. Ah, sì, sì, senza dubbio. If you want to escape the theme park Venice, there are other islands worth a visit. Burano is a real surprise. It's a small island, a short boat ride from Venice. Every house is painted a blindingly bright and cheerful color. Legends say it was to help drunken fishermen find their home after a hard day's drinking. Whilst nearby Murano is famous for glass production, Burano is all about lace. It's been a desirable product since the 16th century, and it's still made here by hand today. Across Burano, an army of local ladies painstakingly hand-stitch the lace from their own homes. Each one of them specializes in a different kind of stitching. It's incredibly intricate, detailed work requiring great skill. A tablecloth can take up to two years to make. Today, there are very few lace makers left capable of producing needle lace like this. It's another great Venetian tradition with an uncertain future. One local tradition that is still going strong is a love of food. My Venetian grandmother always cooked local dishes for me as a child, and I remember them to this day. Delicious. Venetian tradition of food is fantastic. Uh, a few highlights are liver and baby octopus, anything from the sea, in fact. But also, they have a very sweet tooth, Venetians. And all these indulgences that quite often come out just for carnival. None of them look very good for the figure, but they're delicious on the lips. Monica Cesarato is a food writer and Venice's best-known gastronomic guide. Why is there such an amazing and varied cooking tradition in Venice? Because Venice was a port, so there is the influence of all the countries to which it was exposed. So you have a bacala from Northern Europe, you have all the spices from the Middle East, you have all the uh, fruits and vegetables from Africa, and uh, as well as the produce, Venice was importing also all the different recipes. For me, no trip to Venice is complete without eating my favorite Venetian recipe, the fritole or sweet cake. Chef Adacato is a Venetian treasure who makes fritole the way that my grandmother used to. Ben arrivate. Grazie. Questa è Alex? Sì, sì. Alex. Grazie, signora. Buona arrivata. Grazie. So, my nonna used to make these for us, but she only made them in the winter. <laughs> Better to have a high calories in winter than in summer, yes. I suppose. You know. In Venice, frittelle used to be called anything that could be fried. Ah. Now we got to the point where we only identify it as frittella, the sweet cakes for carnival. And uh, frittella is one of the oldest recipes for cakes. It actually goes back to the Roman times. And then in the 1700s, it was declared the national cake of Venice. The dough is simple enough to make. Water, sugar, butter and plain flour, and then you add eggs. She's gonna check if temperature is ready just by putting the... Qui fa le bolle. If you mix it. So when you stick in a wooden spoon and the bubbles rise to the yes. surface, that moment the oil is ready. Yeah, it's okay. exactly to have the right temperature. Once the oil is hot, Ada simply spoons in the fritole mix and cooks until they puff up into golden brown balls, turning regularly. Every city in Italy has um, their specialities. Yes. But in Venice, they have, it seems that Venetians have a very sweet tooth. Yes, because Venice discovered the use of sugar mm. in culinary use rather than pharmaceutical use. Ah. And that's why we got so many cakes. And then with the spices, they combine the sugar with all the spices from, uh, from the Middle East. And... The recipe varies from household to household. 
Some people add ricotta to the dough. Some people fill them with chocolate drops and raisins. But my grandmother made hers with zabaglione cream, a mixture of eggs, sugar and marsala wine. Mm. Now she's uh, putting the powdered sugar on top, like in the old days. And that's what gives the extra sweetness, just in case you didn't have enough. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Buone. La buonissima. Buon marsala col marsala è buono. Oh, mamma mia, quanto mi piace. That is really delicious. Mangi qualcosa e ti vengono così, te, sei trasportata. Yes. It brings you back all the, just one smell, one flavor of something brings you back a memory. It's like, oh, you're there again. Oh, it reminds me so much of my granny. Good. I'm pleased about that. Mm. Mm. Quite honestly, I wasn't expecting to feel as emotional as that. It really brought a complete whoosh of my grandmother back to me. And um, she was an amazing cook, and I'm really sad that I didn't take more advantage at the time. You somehow think when you're young that people are going to be there forever and that things are going to continue in that way forever. But I tell you something, after that example before me, I'm going to go home, and before I forget, I'm going to make sure that I do it at least once. Coming back here has reminded me just how much this city means to me. I think Venice is impossible and magical and unique. And I think unique is a word that's so overused, but this place, there is nowhere else like it in the world. This is the only Venice. I've traveled two hours west of Venice to the majesty of the Italian Alps, home to the great lakes of Garda and Como, but I'm not here for them. Hidden in the mountains is a gem of a place, the remote village of Bagolino. Fascinated by this little village. It's at the end of a road. There's one road in, the same way out, and it is incredibly wealthy, wealthy enough to have constructed this amazing church. Bagolino is a prosperous place whose wealth originates from mining. Today, though, this small hilltop village is home to one of the most expensive cheeses in all of Italy. Bagos is a salty cheese infused with saffron. Only 1,500 wheels are produced each year on small family farms dotted around Bagolino. It doesn't come cheap. Bagos cheese is sold in Rome for 71 pounds a kilo. The Stagnoli family has been producing Bagos cheese for centuries, and they still make the cheese today using the same techniques their ancestors did hundreds of years ago. Alex. Primo. <laughs> Cosa sta facendo? So, uh, formaggio, diciamo. All of that is going to make just one cheese. Lo fa ogni mattina il formaggio? Tutti i giorni. Tutti i giorni della vita. Ah, mm. Sette giorni alla settimana. <laughs> Growing up, he didn't want to do this, and he tried to escape it, but he realized it was useless. This was his destiny. It's bloody hard work. <laughs> so he did the sign of the cross before starting, because this is an important job. He wants it to go well. This milk is 48 degrees, sometimes even 50. And they have the braces. He says his arms are cooked by now. In the beginning, it was a bit harder for him to bear, but he's so used to it now. He says he's, he's tanned from here downwards. Look at this thing, it's enormous. Devi essere forte, mamma mia. Yum, yum. Lei mangia il suo formaggio tutti i giorni? Sì. Sì. Ma calmente. Il suo copro? It takes a minimum of 36 months for this to mature, then the cheese is ready. 
Primo learned his trade from his father. Incredibly, at 82 years of age, Giuseppe Sagnoli is still making Bagos cheese every day. Ooh. Si. Wow. Wow. Che bello che è qui. Mamma mia. Molto impressionante. Questo è più vecchio di quello? Questo ha un anno e mezzo. A year and a half old. Questo ne yeah. ha tre anni. Three years old, yeah. sì. Oppa! Grazie. E ancora vuol provarlo? Mmm. Io non l'ho mai provato prima. No? Mmm. Strano. <laughs> Ma mi piace tantissimo. Mmm. It's quite a strong flavor. Even at a year old. Mmm. Grazie. Mm. It's quite pungent. Mm. It's absolutely delicious. Quanti generazioni della famiglia hanno fatto questo formaggio, secondo lei? Ma da sempre, da 700 anni fa, insomma, sempre fatto questo mestiere, sempre. Forse 8 o 10 generazioni dietro, eh? Te l'ho detto, oriunde, oriunde dall'Ucraina. Amazing. There's a big history here. My gosh. Sette figli? Sette. Quanto, quanti lavorano? Tre fanno questo mestiere. Speriamo che continuino qualche duno, perché sono mestieri che vanno scomparendo. Very encouraging. He says all the old traditions are dying out and he's desperate to keep them alive, at least this one. Per fare questo mestiere bisogna incominciare ancora... Giovane. Fa un altro mestiere tornando indietro da questo... Allora dice che è troppo tardi per me. No. Sarà facile, eh? Uh, he says, really, to do this job well, you have to learn it as a child. In their own way, farms like the Stagnolis are just as much of an Italian treasure as historic cities like Venice. Italy's been mined for years, and yet you can still turn the corner and find something like this that you just never knew existed. I do think that it is really deep in their blood. They love it. Um, and it's obviously something they hold very dear. And if it wasn't for families like these, all the old traditions would die out. One shouldn't over-glamorise this life. It's very hard. It's working 365 days a year, come rain, come snow. You know, I'm only third generation removed from a whole load of subsistence farmers in the hills around Rome. My grandfather's family raised horses for the Italian cavalry. Um, and it was a bloody hard life, and that's why they all escaped. <laughs> they all ran away, and his family moved to England. Uh, I mean, I admire this lot for holding firm. I'm leaving behind the peace and tranquility of the Alps and heading to the big city. No trip to the north of Italy would be complete without a hit of modern Milan. I lived in Rome in my late 20s, and we used to often come to Milan to have a taste of modern Italian life, because, of course, this is the city you live in if you don't want to live in the historic past. The capital of the north and Italy's second largest city, Milan is brash, bold and fun. Even the hotels are achingly cool. It's got a very high opinion of itself, Milan, and one that's probably justified. It's easy to drop an enormous amount of money because the shops are fabulous. And everywhere you see the very modern and the ancient juxtaposed, and I find that very attractive. In a typical way that happens only in Milan, you have a very modern office block next to this glorious galleria. This is a city that's misunderstood. Tourists think it's just some concrete jungle, but actually there's so much here. There's beautiful churches, there's beautiful historic monuments. I've become more and more fond of this city as I've got to know it better. And I think there's plenty to discover and to enjoy here. Milan may have the reputation of being Italy's most modern and forward-thinking city, but it also has a lot of history and tradition too. But to sample some of Milan's finest history, it's not a church you need to hunt out, it's a cafe. 
I don't think there's an Italian alive who doesn't love panettone. I like it toasted with butter and at almost every time of the year. My grandmother used to serve it from Christmas until Easter and it was a highlight of our weekends. If you're going to eat panettone, this is the place to come, Milan. Cafe Cookie is the locals' favorite and lays a claim to serving the best panettone in the world. They've been baking the classic Italian cake since 1936. King of panettone at the cafe is the rather aptly named head baker, Tony. He's been mastering his art for over 20 years. Most of us think of panettone as an Italian Christmas cake. In Tony's kitchen, they bake it all year round. It's not just a seasonal treat here. How many panettones do you make from? Uh, from this, more or less uh, 35, 30 for the one kilo, more or less. We add uh, flour. So how long does the whole process take to make a panettone? From the beginning to prepare the yeast, 36, 40 hours. What goes into panettone then? Obviously yeast, flour. Butter. Yeah. Eggs. The yolk. Yolk. Um, yeah. And uh, sugar. Yeah. And this is uh, with uh, vanilla, orange, peel of orange, candied. Yeah. And Ooh. Very nice. This the, is the food. This is the, give the, the taste uh, of the panettone. Do you like making panettone? Yes. We like because uh, it's, uh, it's different every time, and we have to control the yeast very, very well. What makes the cookies panettone so special is their mother yeast. It's more than 70 years old, refreshed by Tony on a daily basis with more water and flour. Wow. This is called pirlatura. Yes. And give off the panettone it's a strength. good strength. It's a real skill. No, <laughs> you can't just come off the street and learn how to do this. It takes years to learn it well. Ah. Huh? <laughs> See. Before the panettone is ready to go in the oven, the dough is washed with egg, a scattering of flaked almonds, and a yummy topping. We used to get into terrible trouble as children because we used to pick that bit, the topping of the panettone, delicious. It's all sugary and nutty, and we used to leave the cake and just eat the topping, which is very frowned upon, believe me, in my family. Mamma mia, che buono. Sugar on sugar. My dear of heaven. Yeah. <laughs> this is the best bit. Once the cakes have been baked, there's one last secret to their success. So, this is the trick to panettone. Unless they hang it upside down, it collapses like a souffle. So this is how they make sure it keeps its shape. Mm. Now is the sweet moment. Yum, yum. It's better to, to eat after three, five days after, after the cook. It's the all butter. right, I'm, I'm ready to risk it. Mm. My goodness, I don't think I've ever had a panettone so fresh. And this is my favorite by far. It's okay. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The panettone was just for starters. The Milanese main course is still to come. <laughs> Everyone knows Milan is famous for fashion. What you might not know is that it's also home to the world's oldest shopping mall. This arcade was built in homage to Vittorio Emanuele II, the King of Italy, from the Milanese. Built in 1865, it was dubbed Il Salotto di Milano, the living room of Milan. And since then, the Galleria has become the favored meeting place in the city. This has got to be one of the most elegant, beautiful shopping arcades in the whole world. I love it. I love everything about it, from the mosaic floor 
to the unity of all the shop signs being in gold on black. There's the most wonderful shops here, delicious restaurants. This is a hub for Milanese life. This was built in the turbulent era of Italian unification and represented in the mosaics some of the symbols of the bigger cities in Italy. So there is the lily representing Florence and the bull of Turin. It's considered good luck to step on the bull's genitals and you'll see every Milanese person makes a detour just to do that, which is why there's such a hole horn in the mosaic. This galleria took years to build, and on the very day it opened, the architect Mengoni fell to his death right at this spot. In the typical way of Italy, this has now become a lucky area, and the bull is the centre of all that luck. The tradition is you're supposed to spin backwards three times, but I think that tends to mark you out as a tourist. Are these tourists going to step on the bull's balls? Oh, yep. And round he goes. But he's going forward. Someone ought to tell him. Everybody does it, not just tourists, though, even the Milanese. This galleria connects two of Milan's most famous landmarks, the Duomo, the fifth largest cathedral in the world, and the legendary La Scala Theatre. This theatre is a Milanese treasure. Wow, every time I walk into La Scala, I get shivers up my spine. This is probably the most famous opera house in the world, and it has made and broken more reputations than any other. La Scala was opened in 1778, and over the past 200 years, the greatest stars of opera and ballet have performed on this stage. Luminaries such as Luciano Pavarotti, Rudolf Nureyev and Maria Callas. One of the hidden secrets of this Milanese institution is La Scala's workshops, located in an old steel factory on the outskirts of the city. Here you can get a unique La Scala experience, watching the best technicians in Italy design and produce sets and costumes for every production. Ruggero Berlini is the general director of set design at La Scala. This is the falegnameria and the pre-montage scene. In this big space, we try to make the scenes before they are painted. What a beautiful space. This space is incredible. There's one area of the workshop I'm drawn to like a moth to the flame. The costume department. How many new costumes have you made a year? There can be, I don't know, 600 costumes for an opera, just for an opera. In general, there are more operas, nine operas. Otto, nove, dieci opere e cinque, sei balletti. Wow. Sì, ma anche qui c'è una sensazione di calma molto concentrata. Sì, assolutamente. Qui invece abbiamo il magazzino. Wow. Adoro anche tutte le... Tutti i bottoni, tutte le spolette. Mamma mia. Come scegliere? Troppo. Troppo, incredibile. Come la casa delle, delle meraviglie per me. Adoro tutti questi, you know, all these velvet ribbons. I'd like a cupboard like this at home. <gasps> la Scala have built up a priceless collection of over 60,000 costumes, including outfits worn by Pavarotti and Maria Callas. Head archivist Rita is giving me a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to get up close and personal with some operatic history. Poteva portare due seni così importanti. Molto importante. Sì, mamma mia. Sì. Sì, mi sento un po' inadeguata. No, no, no. no. Sei sottile, ti potrebbero stare bene. Invece, questo è il famoso costume sì. di Luciano Pavarotti, 
famoso anche perché firmato come costume da eh, Missoni. A me piacerebbe così tanto vedere qualcosa della Callas. Bene, vuoi vedere la Callas? Posso? Cala? Sì. Italians love opera and I'm no exception. Maria Callas is an idol of mine. Her life was marked by scandals and ended with sudden death at 53. However, in the 10 years she performed, she set the world of opera alight. Piuttosto delicati. E questi sono tutti suoi, mamma mia. Her costumes are now kept under lock and key as they are incredibly valuable and need to be preserved. Puoi vedere quanto era magra questa donna. Mamma mia, che non aveva una vita. No, era... Vita. E qui siamo nel 57-58, quindi il momento più... Più grande della carriera, della più grande. Della carriera, sì. Yes. Ed era alta. Per quegli anni era una, sì. una donna Grazie. alta con, una, con un bel fisico. I can't imagine singing and wearing that. And I'm also pretty impressed by how tiny she was. She had a tiny little waist and she was lovely and tall. I'm very jealous. Oh, wow, look at these, some of these. Ah, questo è Zeffirelli. Zeffirelli from... Look at that! Questo è Zeffirelli, turco in Italia. That's, mamma mia, mi piace così tanto perché è elaborata. Sì, beh, Zeffirelli è già... Isn't that fun? Mamma mia, questo cioè, che... Il polluto. Questo è uno degli ultimi spettacoli che lei ha cantato in scala, quindi 61... Mi sto venendo la pelle d'oca, veramente, sì. toccare una cosa che... che... è stata sua. It's just pretty incredible to be touching this piece of history, and this piece of history that has worn so well. I mean, it's beautiful now, just as it must have been then. Non si insegna, o si insegna poco, cosa è stato il melodramma italiano. So. Che cosa Peccato. sono stati... Sì, veramente, anche perché esiste ancora. Cosa ti chi perché chiedono? Non si chiedono di no, vedere chi? Michael Jackson. <ride> no, non si sa mai alla scala. The last school trip, someone asked if they had a, an outfit that Michael Jackson had worn. <ride> Tutti questi costumi hanno un valore per voi che lavorate in questo reparto. Ci sentiamo di conservare un patrimonio italiano, milanese, ecco, quello. Questo è un patrimonio di tutti, quindi non solo della scala. Sì, è vero. That was just amazing. I could have spent all day there. I think my favorite bit there was obviously the costumes. To hold something of Maria Callas's in my hands was an amazing experience. My trip across the north of Italy is just the beginning. Next time, my journey takes in one of the most beautiful and undiscovered coastlines, and then on towards the hustle and bustle of Rome and the hilltop village where it all began. Coming back here, it's rather amazing that my grandfather made such a success of himself coming from this little place so high in the mountains.